in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, come to our aid and heal our world from the scourge of COVID-19, which is robbing away our loved ones like a wildfire. As a people, we are hurting and helpless. But we believe you will act to save us at your own time, as your time is appropriate and convenient to act. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our Carte cases today, we read about a desperate father, a leader of the synagogue called Jairus, pleading with Jesus to come to his aid and heal his critically ill daughter. Mark chapter 5. Verses 21 to 24 and 35 to 43. On the way to Jairus' house, the story is interrupted by an encounter with a woman who has been ill for 12 years with chronic bleeding. Mark chapter 5, verses 25. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in this pericope of our catechesis today, the evangelist describes Jesus' healing of two daughters of Israel. An elderly one was served for 12 years and a young girl of 12 years respected. However, our focus is upon the dying daughter of Jairus. Through the events of this miracle, we note the synagogue official how he learned to trust in the Lord, even when all circumstances of life seem to be working against him. Jairus was an official of the synagogue, and as such, he was a man of influence and prestige. But he came to Jesus as a desperate parent, seeking to spare the life of his critically ill child. Jesus was not present at what seemed to be the ideal time to deal with the illness of this child. They had crossed over the Sea of Galilee and had not yet returned. Jesus, who could have helped, was not present. From Luke's account, Luke chapter 8, verse 40, we know that when Jesus returned by boat from the other side of the lake, there was a large crowd gathered which had been waiting for his return. Most likely, Jairus was part of the crowd, wringing his hands in dismay, knowing that in a moment his daughter may pass away. Every minute was critical, and the only one who could help was still absent. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we can only envision how Jairus was the first one to greet Jesus as he stepped from ship to shore. Our gospel narrative tells us that Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus, beseeching him to quickly come to the aid of his daughter. 
was on the verge of death. And without delay, Jesus made his way to the home of this dying child, thrown by a horse of onlookers. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus had just performed a successful exorcism of a non-Jewish person on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Confirm Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. In our pericope, Jesus now returns to the other side, now the Jewish side of the sea. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Just to find a large crowd awaiting. Jesus had taken a first step in expanding the kingdom of God beyond the boundaries of previous religious expectation. He had crossed over the Sea of Galilee and landed into the Gentile territory, demonstrating his absolute authority over the local spiritual sovereigns by freeing a man from demonic possession. In response to this dramatic display of his divine power, the people of Gerasa, and because of vested economic interests and their need to preserve their status quo, they politely asked Jesus to leave them. And without forcing himself on them, Jesus obliged to leave and went back to the Jewish side of the sea where a large crowd gathered awaiting him and among them was Jairus. Jairus was a man of great privilege, a respected man, a well-off person. He was a religious leader in the area who supervised and organized the synagogue worship services. Synagogue rulers were well respected by the people. And he was equally a wealthy man. But his privilege did not exempt him from pain or from fear. Despite all his privileges, he was unable to help his 12-year-old daughter, just like any other parent who has begged God to help their child, Jairus does the same. He goes on his knees and begs for the good health of his daughter. He humbled himself forgot his fears, and threw himself at Jesus' feet. On the other hand, Jesus did not look at Jairus in terms of his office, in terms of prestige, or as an urgent opposed to his ministry or spreading the kingdom of God, so as to maintain a respectable distance, but Jesus saw an individual, a human being, a person for flesh and blood in desperate need of help. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we equally need to cultivate this same spirit. As disciples of Jesus, it is easy for us to justify a dismissive attitude towards others and especially those who occupy positions of influence within the power elite. It is easy to look around and see nothing but positions of authority of those individuals. As bosses, executives, 
and see yours. When in fact, we are surrounded by individual persons of flesh and blood, human beings just like ourselves. Jesus made, never made that kind of a mistake. On the contrary, he accepted Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent man of the Sanhedrin, as one of his secret followers. Confirm Mark chapter 15, verse 43. While vehemently denouncing the Pharisees and his institution, Matthew chapter 23, he had no problem of socializing with individual Pharisees like Simon. Confer Luke chapter 7, verse 36. As well as Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And though it was obvious, Anna impressed with Pilate's office, John chapter 19, Verses 10 and 11, Jesus nevertheless spoke freely, openly, and candidly with Pilate as a person. And in every respect, Jesus exemplified and lived out a basic biblical principle. While we owe nothing, to the representatives of the state, other than in the way of loyalty, duty, respect, or allegiance, we still have a very real obligation to them, namely, love. Confer Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And so, when Jairus asked Jesus to come to his aid and lay his hands on his daughter, Jesus does not hesitate for a moment. Immediately, he turns on his heels and heads off towards Jairus' house. His compassion will not allow him to turn down a hurting and helpless soul. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on his way, Jesus is interrupted by a woman with a hemorrhage. It seems that a woman had been suffering from debilitating menstrual hemorrhaging for 12 years. In the instant that this woman touched his clothes, her debilitating flow of blood came to an end. She was cured. She could now retain her life, her blood, her warmth, her vitality. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, at stake in this passage includes two cases of reversing uncleanness a woman with a continual flow of blood, and a corpse. Even after the flow stopped, the first woman would be counted unclean for seven days. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 28. The dead girl was even more unclean, so that one who touched her contracted impurity for a week. Numbers chapter 19, verse 11. If this woman touched anyone or anyone's clothes, she rendered that person ritually unclean for the rest of the day. Leviticus chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. Some uncleanness was unavoidable, but it was inconvenient to fulfill the required bath, and men avoided uncleanness 
when they come. Because she rendered unclean anyone she touched. She should not have even been in this heavy crowd. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look at the latter Jewish tradition, made this danger even more serious than Leviticus had. So, many teachers avoided touching women other than their wives altogether, lest they become accidentally contaminated. Thus, she could not touch or be touched, was probably now divorced or had never married, and was marginal to Jewish society. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now revert to our Bible text for our reflection. And it reads in part, when Jesus had just crossed back over in the boat to the other side, a great multitude was gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name came, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and begged him much, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her that she may be made healthy and live. And he went with him. Mark Chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. And about sisters in Christ, the Sea of Galilee has both a gentle eastern shore and a Jewish western shore. And Jesus moves by boat between these two shores, ministering to both the Jews and the Gentiles alike. And now, Jesus is returned to the Jewish side after ministering to the Gentile side. When Jesus had crossed back over in the port to the other side, a great multitude was gathered to him. And he was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, came and saying, and seeing him, we fell at his feet. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jairus was a prominent member of the community. Lay people routinely led synagogue services, but the synagogue leader was responsible for the synagogue facility. The security of the scrolls, the selection and overnight worship leaders, and the general administration of the synagogue. And as a result, Jairus was clearly an insider, a person who counted among those that had a social standing. It is worth noting that. The last time Jesus visited the synagogue, the Pharisees and the Herodians tried to kill him. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. And the next time we visit a synagogue, they will take offense at him. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. In Luke's version, they will try to kill him. Luke chapter 4, verse 29. However, Jairus fell at Jesus' feet and begged him much. In one sense, this is remarkable. 
As a man of authority, Jairus must be concerned for his age. Jesus, a visiting teacher, has no official position and the Pharisees and the Herodians are plotting to kill him as a matter of fact. And to seek Jesus' help, Jairus must set aside all his pride to come as a supplicant to this itinerant and controversial young man, young preacher. In another sense, though, there is nothing at all remarkable about J Jairus' appeal. A parent of a dying child will do nearly anything to save his child. Jairus is driven by desperation to seek Jesus' help. And this is the first of the three stories in this gospel of how parents bring their children to Jesus for help. The two other, one is the Syrophoenician woman, in Mark chapter 7, verses 25 to 30. And the other one is the father of the son of the spirit. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And in all these three cases, the parents experience obstacles to the children's healing. But they persist. And Jesus heals all three children. Jairus says, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made healthy and live. Jairus' invitation to come contrasts with the Jerusalem's request that Jesus goes away from them. Where the Jerusalem's responded to Jesus' miracles with fear, Jairus responds with faith. He does not ask Jesus to help if he can. He instead expresses confidence that Jesus can restore his daughter's health if you only lay his hands on her. Jesus went with him. While a great crowd had gathered around Jesus, Jesus takes time to go with this anguished father. The crowd is never more important than the individual who is in need. And the brothers and sisters in Christ, this is an important model for our ministry even today. To be concerned with the needs, not only of the majority of the people that we say, but also of the minority, the non-entities. We may not save all those that we transport from everywhere to our prayer services, but to address their individual spiritual as well as physical needs at their doorsteps, thereby bring them healing and salvation where they are. And Jesus leaves the crowds in preference of the little dying girl whose father has asked for help. However, due to the slow pace of movement, because of the crowds and an interruption, the lady with the hemorrhage, Jesus could not make it in record time. While he was still speaking, People came to the synagogue's ruler's house saying, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? 
But Jesus, when he heard the message spoken, immediately said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He came to the synagogue's ruler's house and he saw an apple weeping and great wailing. When he had entered in, he said to them, Why do you make an apple and weep? The child is not dead, but is asleep. The ready killed him, but he having put them all out, took the father of the child, her mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was lying. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means the interpreted girl, I tell you, get up. Immediately the girl rose up and walked, for she was 12 years old. They were amazed with great amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and he commanded that something should be given to her to eat. Mark chapter 5, verses 35 to 43. And about sisters in Christ, there is never a good time to receive bad news. But it seems that the bad news usually comes at the worst of times. And the bad news has a way of devastating us, especially when the situation appears to be impossible. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Because bodies became decomposed rapidly in Palestine. Mourners had to be assembled immediately upon someone's death, presumably especially when it had been expected. And in this case, they had gathered before when even with giants that his daughter had died. Messengers were normally dispatched immediately to bring a parent or spouse the sad news. This story of the death of Jairus' daughters is reminiscent of Lazarus' resurrection. If Jesus had come earlier, he could have prevented Lazarus' death. Once Lazarus died, Martha and Mary lost hope in Jesus' power to help. However, our evangelist does not tell us Jairus' reaction when he sees the mourners. But we can only imagine his desolation when he sees that rise for the day have in fact begun. But Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. These three men constitute Jesus is in a circle and will be invited to accompany Jesus at the transfiguration. And also at Gethsemane when he went to pray at all. Jesus saw an uproar and great wailing, mourning, including professional mourners, well, beat their breasts, tear their hair, and render their garments. 
flows play a dirig. These actions alert the community of the death of a person and signify the grief. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we consider the custom of professional mourners, we should not discount the presence of real grief. The tragic death of a child would break the hearts of parents, break the hearts of friends and neighbors in any time or any circumstance. There is no hope of resurrection manifested here, nothing to stand as a counterpoint to the grief that accompanies death. The crowd with Jairus said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Jesus tells Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord had the bad report and immediately he ministered hope to Jairus by telling him not to give up. Jesus was calling Jairus to a deeper faith. Jesus calls to each and every of us to a deeper faith as well. He allows no one to follow as they go to see the little child. Mourners are inappropriate for a girl who will soon be walking and eating. To the crowd, Jesus says, why do you make an uproar and weep? The child is not dead, but is asleep. Sleep is a temporal condition, but death is permanent. This girl will soon be up and running. So Jesus considers her condition temporary. However, they ridicule him. The crowd has no doubt regarding the little child's death. They are common prepares us for the difficulty of the miracle Jesus was about to work. Jesus limits the audience for the healing, for the resurrection, to the parents of the little girl and those who are with him, namely Peter, James, and John. And taking the child by hand, he said to her, Talita kum, which means girl, I tell you, get up. Talita kum is Aramaic, a Semitic language related to Hebrew. Among the Jews, Aramaic was used by the common people, while Hebrew remained the official language of a region and the government and the upper class. The evangelist Mark translates Talita Kum into Greek for gentle Christians of the early church who might not know Aramaic. Taking the child by the hand, touching this girl violates the Torah law, which renders a person who touches a dead body unclean until you. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 39. Or for seven days, Numbers chapter 19, verse 11. Such a person is required to remain outside the camp if defiled. Numbers chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. By reaching out, and grabbing the hand of a corpse, Jesus is explicitly 
disregarding two very clearly stated purity calls from Leviticus and the Numbers. In this chapter, Jesus violates many taboos. The story of the jealous and demonic in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, where Jesus went to a graveyard where he dealt with a legion of unclean spirits, and a great head of pigs perished. He affirmed the unclean woman for touching his garment in faith. And now he touches a corpse. However, instead of being defiled by the little girl's body, Jesus' touch removes the potential for defilement. Surely, no one can any more accuse Jesus of touching a woman with a discharge if she is now clean, or touching a corpse if the girl is now walking and eating. Immediately, the girl rose up and walked for she was 12 years old. The little girl is 12 years old, which corresponds to the 12 years that the woman suffered with the hemorrhage. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this. This, as a matter of fact, seems odd, because there was no way that the crowd would not learn of the girl's healing and, and resurrection. And there was no way that the crowd would keep the news quiet. This command is reminiscent of the earlier situation where Jesus told a healed leper to say nothing to anyone except the priest. But the leper proclaimed it openly so that Jesus could no more openly enter into a city but was outside in deserted places. However, there came to him from everywhere. Why would Jesus tell people not to spare the word of these healings? But he have answered in Christ. It is a matter of time. While he would disclose more fully to his disciples the meaning of his messianic mission, he will reveal to the crowds only what they are prepared to understand. Salient points for further reflections. When Jesus crossed over back, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, there came Jairus, one of the synagogue leaders, with an urgent appeal if Jesus would come with him so he could lay hands on his daughter and heal her. Jesus responded by going with him. While Jesus was on the way to the synagogue's uh, leader's home, he was interrupted by a woman who had a serious illness for years. Accordingly, she had tried to find the help, but had been unsuccessful. In fact, she had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. This woman believed that if she could simply touch the garment of Jesus, she could be made well again. And miraculously, this is exactly what happened. In the moment she touched Jesus, he realized that the power had gone out from him. He stopped to find out what touched him. But the disciples questioned, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched you? But Jesus knew 
what had taken place. After a few moments, the woman who had been healed came to Jesus and told him everything. Jesus responded, Daughter, your faith has saved you. The woman's condition was no more than physical. She was losing more than blood. She was losing her life. Its warmth, its vitality, and its fruitfulness. That is a spiritual matter. At one level, this is a story of an individual woman. But on another level, it is a human story. Her story is our story. Drained of life, we go through our emotions. We may feel disconnected, isolated, and even alone. Oftentimes, we are convinced that once this or that happens, everything will get better. We no longer have to live drained of life. But if we can touch his clothes, we too shall be healed. Every moment, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, holds before us the opportunity to touch him. And to walk the path of peace, fully alive and healed as daughters and sons of God. Before Jesus could continue with his gentle, generous home, word came that Charles' daughter had died. Undeterred, however, Jesus encouraged us, do not be afraid, only believe. He then continued his journey to his home. The scene outside of Jairus' house is typical for that day when someone had passed away. People were weeping and wailing. Jesus, however, was unfazed by this. He went into the house, to the place where the child was. He took the girl by the hand and spoke in Aramaic. Little girl, he said to you, get up. Those that saw what took place were utterly astounded. Sometime, Godless things in our life to die. Maybe a relationship or a situation. He allows them to dry up, to wither, so that when he steps into our life or our situation and brings back everything to life, we oh will know it could only have been God, God himself, who did it. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is easy to forget the lesson of the woman with a hemorrhage in the midst of a story of a dying girl. We can even forget that God sees and that God cares even in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. As we whisper like Lazarus' sisters, if you had only been here. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the midst of grief, when pain invades our life, and it feels like the bottom has fallen out, we even forget that God is not just God that comes to us. He's not just the God that searches out the unwanted. He's not just the God that goes in search of the one lost lamb. He is the God that steps through the fabric 
of all eternity to save you and me. God laid down his life to bridge the gap that you and I could never bridge. He is the God who spoke time into existence and holds you and me firmly in his grip. He is the God with a plan for our life. Even when we cannot understand the pain we are going through, such as COVID-19 pandemic, death is but a word to our God. Nothing can separate us from him. God cares for us. And the things that weigh us down, God is able to restore what has been lost. God is able to restore what has been broken. And God is able to restore what has died in us. God is never too busy to care about. He is God, and he meets each and every of us where we are. In the street of desperate for healing, in our bed too weary to even rise. Remember, no wilderness is too vast, no storms too furious, no darkness is too great. And no period is too solid for him to break through and find you right just there. My dear one and sisters in Christ, you were on the devil's hit list before you were even born. But no one says your story ends until the master and the author of your life says it. We may have to walk through the dreadful situation of COVID-19 to be robbed of all of our loved ones. It is a reminder that God can step into every situation. Dreadful as it may be. No matter how dark, how helpless, how final it looks, God will make a way, even when it seems bleak. God will heal the world and humanity. He is faithful. Even when we cannot immediately see his presence, in this seemingly hostile and unsympathetic environment. But God is there. His time is the best to rise us all up in our varied situations, in our relationships, in our ministry, in our business opportunities, in our vision in our dreams, and indeed in our faith. Let us pray. God our Father, you prod us not to fear, but believe. Your Son has authority to speak to a storm, to heal our physical illnesses, and to raise us from the dead. May we take heart to know that you hear our petitions. You are always on time. Your timing is always perfect. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 